from GBH Forum Network. This is Footnote. So why do we use footnotes? First of all, to reference the sources, and also to add some comments. Hi, I'm Andrew Vanoss, and I will be your host for Footnote, a podcast about everything. Politics, environmental science, mental health, and much more. Today, we'll be considering villains on TV and in films, and why, after decades of so-called family entertainment, villainy has become so mainstream. Back in the old days when there was only network TV, advertisers were very powerful. You know, and advertisers didn't want their products advertised on shows that were kind of mean or negative. They didn't want their products identified with something kind of ugly. Um, so there was a kind of pressure for networks to keep things upbeat and to keep things simple for you know the least common denominator. So you had good guys and bad guys, black and white. You know it was simple as can be. You had Leave It to Beaver. You had you know. I mean, compare Marcus Welby, if any of you are old enough to remember him, to, you know, Dr. House. Villains have been tormenting our heroes forever, though in recent years they've become some of the most heralded characters in popular culture. Once the object of scorn, viewers now want to be them. Why is that? And how has public consumption of media encouraged and adapted to this change? In January 2019, Boston Globe TV critic Matthew Gilbert spoke with GBH's Edgar B. Herwick III. Later, we'll hear from Boston University Assistant Professor of Film and Television, Adam Lapidus. The original presentation on villains featuring Matthew Gilbert was part of the Forum Network's Boston Talks series. You know, audiences actually do crave reality. They want grayness. They want their villains to, you know, to resemble real people. They want, um, they want to see real life up on the screen and, or on the little screen or on the big screen in your den or whatever you want to call it. So um, I think that was a big shift. I think everybody woke up and thought, wait a minute, we thought audiences couldn't handle you know, negativity and Tony Soprano and, you know, ugly things and people who are good guys but then do horrible things and horrible people who do good things. People can't handle that. And the Sopranos opened everybody's eyes. I mean, there were hints, there were clues before that. Hill Street Blues, or and even more so NYPD Blue with Andy Sipowitz, yeah, yeah. you know, was a precursor to Tony Soprano in some ways. Is some of it as simple as, I mean, I mean you just, you sort of, you sort of blasted through it there, but you went like, you know, on the big screen or on the small screen in your right. house, whatever. But just right. like, you know, this coincides with a time where a 40 inch plasma screen comes right. down in price and everybody goes from having sort of square tube TVs to these sort of widescreen 40 inch televisions that has penetration in the program. Something as simple as that, does that add to this like fuel to the fire of this happening? Absolutely. That brings the cinematographers over, that allows the storytelling to be more visual because you have these beautiful screens? Yes, yeah. definitely. Um, you know, cinematographers like, you know, Breaking Bad, I mean, look at that show. I don't know if any of you have seen it. But I mean, it's spectacular. It. To you're, you're just look like, at, thank right? God you talked I mean, about every shot, bad. especially after the first season, they changed cinematographers, and it it just went up to ne the next level. And every shot on that show is amazing. Or, so, or Mad Men, I think of as well. Mad Men, sort of like a, take pause it at any point, and it's a pain. Yeah. Right? So there was the there was the the business model that shifted, but then I think also culturally. People were ready for realness on screen. I think there was a hunger for to see something other than, you know, good, by, good guys going up against bad guys. And I think, you know, maybe, I don't know what that's from. That's from, you know, the news media expanding and everybody seeing the world as it is more than they used to back in the 50s when, you know, we had Leave it to Beaver. You know, suddenly people wanted to see gray. So. You know, you mentioned The Sopranos as, you know, there was hints before, but that being a real game changer. Uh, what makes Tony Soprano work as a character? And is, is it, like, 
give, give us a sense of why he is groundbreaking. I think he challenged the audience morally. You know, when you're watching a good guy who's really, really good and a bad guy who's really, really awful, there's no moral, you don't have to ask yourself questions. It's good and bad. Tony Soprano made you ask lots of questions like, is he horrible? He's trying to get better. He's in therapy. We, you know, it's a psychological show, so we got to see the root of his pathology or his uh, sociopathology. No, wait, what's the uh, sociopathology? sociopathology. Yeah. yeah. So suddenly he was more sympathetic. I can't say that he was redeemed, really, but by anything that he did, and certainly not in the end, but he, he, he made us ask ourselves why we were drawn to him and why we wanted to pay attention to him and why he was so interesting. And I think that was the key to the end of the show. Um, I think, you know, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen The Sopranos, but if you haven't seen The Sopranos, pfft, whatever. Um, you know, it, the screen went black, I'm sure you all know that, and, and I felt that we were, it was David Chase, the creator of the show, basically saying, you decide. Does he get killed? Does he live? Is he gonna be punished for what he did? Do you think he should be punished? You know, I think it was more of the same throwing the moral weight onto the viewer and asking us to think it through. We follow codes, orders. So does that justify everything that you do? Excuse me, let me tell you something. When America opened the floodgates and let all us Italians in, what do you think they were doing it for? Because, because they were trying to save us from poverty? No, they did it because they needed us. They needed us to build their cities and dig their subways and to make them richer. The Carnegies and the Rockefellers, they needed worker bees and there we were. But some of us didn't want to swarm around their hive and lose who we were. We wanted to stay Italian and preserve the things that meant something to us. Honor and family and loyalty. And some of us wanted a piece of the action. Diving deeper into this villainous topic, GBH intern Just Neil Mahal spoke with Boston University professor and longtime TV writer Adam Lapidus. Thank you for joining me, Adam. Are you ready to delve into the world of villains? I am. Oh, so excited. A little scared, a little scared, but more excited. <laughs> so why are audiences drawn to villainous lead characters? Um, I think it has to do with um, there the, are people doing things that you might want to do, but you know in the real world you can't do. You know, it's living vicariously through that. And, you know, I was thinking about that. And it kind of also goes to another way, um, like your Marvel movies and your Star Trek and Star Wars movies. It's all about, like, I wish I could be on the you know, USS Enterprise, but I can't, but I can watch it, you know, or I wish I could be in a TIE fighter and doing this. I can't, but I can watch it and live it that way. And I think it goes the other way in a, in a darker way with villains. Like, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a mob boss, you know, but it's kind of an exciting thought to want to be able to, like, if someone pisses you off, whack them, you know, or make money, you know, illegally and do that. But I will never do that. But I can sit there and watch someone do these horrible things that I wouldn't do, but I can kind of live through them and kind of enjoy it vicariously without worrying about going to jail or ending up in a hole in the desert, you know. <laughs> so I think it's a lot of that. Yeah, definitely. What, what makes a good villain like characteristics wise when you're writing a villain right what goes into it right and here's the other thing where i'm gonna go off the villain because it is a villain because you can do a movie about a villain and the joker right and just have them be unredeemable and you're there for two hours and you have a good time you can't do that in television because you need people to come back every week and if this person is unredeemable that probably won't happen so when you talk about Tony Soprano as a villain, you know, it's interesting for me, if I was writing Sopranos and I never got to, and I wish I could have, it'd been awesome. Um, but he's not only, I wouldn't think of him as a villain. He's my protagonist. He's the guy people have to like and come back week after week after week, right? So when you're thinking about writing a, a villain or someone who's not likable for television, I tell my students, you have to give them something relatable, 
because if they're just horrible, people are not going to want to like them and come back week after week. So that's the challenge of being more of a television writer with bad characters. And with Tony Soprano, um, I got this secondhand, but I kind of believe it, that when David Chase pitched the show, the concept was a mob boss who's just trying to be a good dad. And that's why he's in therapy. So he can go out and kill and do things like that. But, you know, you can relate to, like, he just wants to be a good dad, you know, and most people can kind of relate to that kind of scenario. So while he's doing evil things, you're kind of in a weird way rooting for him because you see the human side of him. So I think that's the the big tightrope we walk in television when we have bad characters, you know, like Shameless and Ray Donovan, you know. You have to make sure you give them something the audience can go, oh, this poor person. Like Tony Soprano had a horrible mother, (laughs) if you remember. So people go, oh, God, my mother was horrible too, or whatever you want to say. So you have that like, oh, he's got that human side, and I understand what's going on. Is Tony a bad guy? And does that impact how we view him as a villain or an anti-hero? Right, and that's the moral question, and that's the interesting part about it. Like, is he a bad guy if you say... If you separate the character, killer, mob boss, all that, yeah, he's a bad guy. But then if you just did the show about the home where he's trying to be the good dad and, you know, be a good, you know, husband and stuff like that, you go, no, he's a good guy. He's trying hard. So the great thing about that show, which I agree with the clip, is it blurred, really blurred those lines, which you can do, I think, much more in television because you can can slowly get this out. So it's always wonderful to think someone's horrible and then go, oh, wait a minute. I was wrong about that, and I call that kind of the bully syndrome. If you watch movies a lot or TV, the bully who's the most horrible person, when they turn, you almost like them more than anybody else because you're so happy that this horrible guy who is going to beat up the little person you know, after school suddenly is protecting him. I mean, you go completely the other way. So I think that's what happens. You can get that kind of huge differential in emotions when you have a character who's so horrible on one side but then, you know, just wanted to be this good person on the other side. Because like I always say, I mostly do comedy. Extremes are funny. And I think that goes with emotions as well. So, you know, who's to say? I get, it kind of depends on your point of view. I'm sure people cannot get over the fact that he did that and they won't. You know, and again, the difference is he's a TV character. If he were a real person, I don't think I'd have the sympathy I would have had if he was a real mob boss killing people. I also wouldn't know about his family life, but I wouldn't. I don't think guys care because you can still take that step back and go, oh, it's not real, I, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a documentary is what I'm hoping. Exactly. If it is, I'm totally messed up, yeah. So you a private eye? No. Ex-cop? No. Military? I was told that Mr. Donovan is discreet and not afraid of violence. You've heard of my son's abduction? Yes. Last night, the kidnappers contacted the media. This morning, they demanded $5 million in ransom. Don't you think that's strange? Could be. Well, you've dealt with this kind of thing before. Kidnapping. No. Oh, I assume you're too busy saving people from themselves, covering things up, huh? I guess. Guess. Could be, sure. Okay, is this the way you usually obtain employment? By muttering two-word answers? You don't want me here, I can go. When I've offended you? No. You're just wasting my time. You got a job for me? Tell me what it is. Not? Thanks for the pen, you got a nice house. Now wait, Mr. Donovan. Exactly what do you do? I changed the story. I've got an entire publicity department to do that. Yeah? Have them go get your kid. If you know the show Ray Donovan, I've heard of it. Which yeah. for me, and I don't people yell, I think that's as good. I think that show did not get its due with Leo Schreiber. I that th- that show just blew me away. I think it was so amazing. Very similar. Leo Schreiber plays a fixer who's a guy from Boston, you know, who grew up poor with a horrible, horrible father played by John Voight. Um who basically does the same thing. He fixes when someone in Hollywood gets in trouble, kills somebody, he takes care of it, but it leads him down to he'll kill people too. But it's the same thing. He's trying to take care of his family and things like that. And then it keeps going back. What they do is you find out that he was a Catholic kid from Boston who got molested by a priest. So again, it's that thing 
where you go, oh, how did this happen? And then you have the priest and Ray Donovan, who's the evil one? Because you also don't learn that person's backstory, you know? But I agree, like, if you're going to have that person who's who's going to be pure evil, but you want to like that, you need to have to set the bar higher. And just to digress a little bit, in comedy and also like a show like Shameless, yeah, you can also go the other way. In Shameless, I didn't watch all of it, but I watched, you know, some of the beginning where he, the dad, William H. Macy, he's also horrible, right? Mm -hmm. But in the pilot episode, he has a young daughter who loves her father. And because she's so good and loves her father, you want to redeem the father. And this is a this is a way to make characters likable. And again, just to digress, do you know who Jim Brooks is? Yeah. Okay, so he's my idol and he gave me my start. He gave me two of my big breaks. And he's like, I would say arguably the best television writer. Don't argue, it's true. He told me, because I did an episode of The Simpsons and I, I was kind of talking, I said, well, Homer's a, not a great guy. He chokes his children. And he said, yes, but Marge loves him. And he said, it's the same thing when you go back to Ralph Cramden it's the same thing when you go back to All in the Family with Archie Bunker. These are three of the same, he says, it's the same relationship. These are horrible guys, but their wives are wonderful and you love them and they love their husbands. So there has to be something redeeming about them. And that's the opposite way to go. You can, if you have somebody horrible, you can say something even worse and go, well, he's not as bad as, you know, Joe Pesci, yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in Goodfellas, you know, okay, so I like that guy because he's not Joe Pesci, but then you can go the other way um, which I encourage my students to do a lot if you have a character in television is find a nicer way to go with someone who's wonderful and sweet. And if they love this character, the audience will then like the character more and feel more like, oh, please be good for the daughter. Please be good for your wife. Please be good for or your husband, whatever you want to go. If you're talking like, they talked about Nurse Jackie that way too. You know, she was not a great person, but her husband was pretty nice and he was working hard and he loved her. So, you know, it kind of brings you in that way. I resent what you're insinuating. Why on earth would my nursing student flush a man's ear down the toilet? But I'm the one who found it. Mm -hmm. And there are firemen who set their own fires just to call them in. You know, you're not wrong. My Uncle Gary torched a hobby store. Uh, that was an insurance thing. Uh, but anyway, I hope you get to the bottom of this. So Mad Men, The Sopranos, Breaking Bad's lead antiheroes are, you know, middle-aged white men mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm curious on your take like why are there so few women and people of color starring in these roles or i guess maybe some shows like nurse jackie that do have that representation but people mm -hmm. may have missed right i'm gonna to be super honest in my opinion i think you know it's still dominated by men mm -hmm. you know white men who i don't think want to write an anti-hero who is a person of color or a woman because I think that opens them up to a lot of ridicule, um, rightly so, I think, because who are you to do this? So like I said, Ray Donovan, the show I talked about, was created by a woman, huh. um, but she made her anti-hero a man. So maybe it's also still that's just what's expected in the world. Like people don't want to root against a woman. Um, I think, again, Game of Thrones might have changed that. <laughs> Cersei was pretty nasty. Yeah. You know, I do not want to be caught with Cersei on a vacation. You know, she <laughs> seems pretty cranky. Um, so I think it's one of these things that's slow and happening. I think it'll happen more when, you know, more diversity and women and people of color come in because they'll be more comfortable to make someone who looks like them an anti-hero or evil because they'll be like, okay, maybe I know that person or, you know, hey, this is my world, so I know what I'm talking about. So I think it's part of the process of television features trying to grow, trying to be more inclusive, just taking their time. From monsters of the 1930s to demons of the 2020s, villains on the radio and in the movies and on television have entertained us with their snide, smug, seditious, and sometimes sympathetic behavior. And in all that time, one theme emerges over and over again. Bad guys want to be loved, just like everyone else. I would go back to, you know, Frankenstein and the werewolf as like, you would think Frankenstein's evil, correct? Yeah. But when you watch it and, you know, read the book, which is a very different movie, he just wants to be loved and accepted. He, it's like, he didn't choose to be a monster. 
And all he wants, both in the book, the theme of it is he just wants to be accepted, right? So you can go back to that. And the werewolf, which I loved about Lon Chaney Jr.'s, I mean, again, he's a werewolf, you know, he's eating people. But if you watch those old movies, which I loved as a kid, especially when they met Abbott and Costello, can't get better than that. He's horrified at being a werewolf. You see it. He's he doesn't want to be a werewolf. He just he's just he's just like he tries to lock himself up. Talk about like an anti-hero. Those are both anti-heroes dressed up as monsters, and you wouldn't think about it. So I think it's always been there. I think it's a matter of kind of where the world's at, um, and I think now with more shows and you know these wonderful thing where people can really have their singular vision, which is so great at what's happening in television right now. Like you can ha- you can have a singular vision and going back to like Broad City, I mean any shows like that, you know, these two wonderful women had an idea and it got on the air and they had a show. That's fantastic. And it wasn't gone through the ringer of like in my day of a network who's, you know, my one of my favorite expressions is a horse by committee is a camel. You know, you have an idea, this horse, and then by the time it gets to the network, it's a camel. So I think people can break boundaries more and take more chances. So Back in my day, no one wanted to, you know, none of those people, those stand-ups who wanted to be in a sitcom, wanted to be, they wanted to be good and likable and everybody loved me. So that's a very interesting twist. And again, Nurse Jackie. Um, Edie Falco. Edie Falco. Like, I don't know if she was involved in the development or she, how she got the job. But again, Edie Falco making a, tr- a great decision, which I think as an actor would want to make, is that I'm going to be a star of my own TV show. I'm a horrible person. That's brave and that's interesting, you know? And I think there'll be more. I'm hoping there'll be more of that. Adam, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure. I, this is great. So you got me out of the house in the afternoon. I love that. <laughs> thank you for listening to Footnote and our Boston Talks discussion on villains. The original Forum Network event featuring Boston Globe TV critic Matthew Gilbert, Boston University PhD candidate Frankie Venaria, and GBH's Edgar B. Herwick III can be found on our website, forum-network.org. And thanks again to Boston University Assistant Professor Adam Lapidus. More about him at bu.edu. This episode of Footnote was written and produced by Just Neil Mahal and Dave Goodman, and mixed by Dave Goodman. Our team includes producers Frederic Rigolo and me, Andrew Vanoss. Annie Schreffler is our executive producer. Music on this episode was provided by Lee Rosevear and Digital Juice. Footnote is a project of the Forum Network. We're grateful to the Lowell Institute for their financial support of this program and listeners like you. Our website is forum-network.org, where you'll find all our talks from the past 15 years. If you've seen or heard a talk you would like us to further explore, Send your requests to forum underscore network at wgbh.org. We appreciate you listening, and please come back for another episode of Footnote.